Hello, my name's Hamish Johnston, and I'm going to tell you about Force K6 so that you know more about them ahead of your trip up north. Now, you may wonder why it's me that's telling you the story. Well, it's because my grandfather was one of the senior officers of Force K6, and a few years ago, I researched and wrote about their story. But on the left um, is a, a, the cover of my story of the Force K6 more generally called A Corner of Pakistan in Scotland, which Colourful Heritage published. But today I'm going to talk specifically about Force K6 in Speyside in 1942. When you go to Canusi, you'll visit the nine graves of the soldiers of Force K6 of the Royal Indian Army Service Corps. The men died in this neighborhood during World War II. And what I'm going to do today is to tell you why they came to be there and what they did when they were here in Scotland. This is a map of Europe in 1939-40 when war broke out between Britain and France against Germany, then under Hitler's Nazi regime. At this time, the Indian subcontinent was part of the British Empire, so everybody there was Indian. After World War II ended, India became independent, except that the subcontinent was divided into three separate countries. This event was known as partition, and it created India, Pakistan, and East Pakistan. Later, in 1971, East Pakistan became Bangladesh. The men of Force K6 came from the Punjab in the Northwest, so they were Indian then, but today they would be Pakistani. The Second World War started on the 3rd of September, 1939. Now this is a photograph of the conditions on the Western Front in France in the First World War, 1914-1918. It helps explain why the Indian Army Force K6 came to Europe in 1939. Since 1918, the British Army's transport had been almost entirely mechanized with trucks. So how could they manage if there was a repeat of the mud and trenches of World War I? An urgent request was therefore made to India for help with animal transport, and this was readily agreed. The bulk of the Indian Army was stationed in Northwest India because this remote and mountainous area was populated by warring tribes that resisted government control. And also, the Northwest was India's vulnerable border, open to invasion from Russia and Iran, so it needed to be defended. To operate in this country, the Indian Army used animal transport, principally mules. The Royal Indian Army Service Corps was responsible for providing the fighting regiments of the Indian Army with transport, supplies, and food wherever they were. So the mule companies were a principal function of the Royal Indian Army Service Corps. Within two months of Britain's request, India had put together Force K-6 in the late summer of 1939. It consisted of four mule companies, plus the necessary support units and headquarters. Each company had around 315 officers and men, 284 mules, and 132 carts. So in total, Force K-6 had around 1,800 men and 2,000 mules. They sailed from Mumbai on 10th December, 1939, in four transport ships escorted by a destroyer. They went through the Suez Canal and reached Marseille in southern France in 16 days, arriving on the 26th of December, 1939. On arrival, the companies joined the British Army's expeditionary force in Northeast France. Until May, 1940, things were quiet. It was known as the Phony War. But on 10th of May, this ended with the German Blitzkrieg invasion of France. 
the Germans overwhelmed the British expeditionary force, which had to get out of France as fast as possible. This was the famous Dunkirk evacuation. Number 22 company of K6 was captured by the Germans, but all the rest escaped from Dunkirk and also from the ports of Brest and Saint-Nazaire in the west. But unfortunately, all the companies had to leave their mules, equipment and supplies behind. The companies were now dispersed around England. They were brought together in Derbyshire, where on the 8th of August 1940, the whole force was inspected by King George VI, number one in the picture, and Queen Elizabeth, number two, number three. They are the parents of our present queen. The officer next to the king is Lieutenant Colonel Hills, the commanding officer, number two, and Major Finley is the officer on the right, wearing gaiters, number four. The three surviving companies were re-equipped with horses and mules, and three more companies arrived from India in May 1941. Initially, K6 was ba based in Wales, where they provided transport for training exercises with infantry regiments. And then they came to Scotland in 1942. And why was that? The reason is that Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, had a plan to invade Norway, which was occupied by German forces that threatened the supply convoy routes to Britain's Russia, so to Britain's ally Russia. Norway is a mountainous and snowy country, so this plan would require British infantry to be trained in snow and mountain warfare. Scotland was chosen to take over from Wales as the best place for this training to be done, and the K6 mule companies were ideal to support it. Let's now get you prepared for your journey to Force K6 country. Your guide will tell you to get ready at, at Dramochta Pass, the top of the A9 road and the watershed of Scotland. From here, all the rivers flow north. The place names to look out for are Dalhwini, where the, the troop train stopped. They bivouacked here and the next day marched 13 miles to Newton Moor. Newton Moor is where they bivouacked overnight on day one of the march. The next day, they marched 10 miles to their camps. Community Cemetery, where you will see the graves, is close by. The camps were at Loch Inch and Loch Alvey. And then comes Abbey Moor, a small town where a hotel served as a hospital and where the supply section was based. And finally on the map, Glen Moor, where you'll be able to explore the immediate area yourselves when you get there. The training areas are in the hills on either side of the road there. This is a more detailed map of uh, the second part of the journey. At King UC Cemetery, you are on the old A9 road that the K6 men marched along to their camps. When you're at the cemetery, look across the road towards the hills on the east side of the valley. The X on this map shows where Khan Mohammed got lost and died. From the cemetery, you'll travel on the new road, but the old road runs very close to it on your right hand side. Watch out for Loch Inch and then Loch Alvey on the right, where the two main camps were. You can't see Kinrara but it was a big mansion that they used as a hospital. At Avi Moor, the hotel used as a hospital has been demolished. The supply depot was at the railway sidings near the railway station. So it was over a period of six weeks in June and July, 1942, that they came in special trains to Dalhwini station, which you'll pass when you go to see the cemetery. Dalhwini is the first village after Dramochta, about five miles on, at the head of Loch Erecht. It's on your left, and look out for the railway line at the back of the village. Let's now go back to 1942 and look at the, at the way of life of the K6 men camped near Aviemore. The photos are official army ones taken on site in 1942. 
They show the camps with the troops under canvas and the mules grazing. Camps were always near a water supply, grazing, and a railway line for the tons of supplies that had to be brought in all the time. The staple meat part of the men's diet was mutton. Whole flocks of sheep were bought locally. Veterinary inspections were made of the sheep intended for, for their consumption, and on one occasion, 77 sheep suffering from infectious pneumonia had to be rejected. When fresh meat was unavailable, the men had to eat a substitute of tinned mutton, and if that was unavailable, tinned fish. When mutton was available, the companies had their own butchers to slaughter the sheep in the approved way. They had their own cooks to make familiar food like curries and chapatis. Despite war conditions, the Indian uh, ingredients like spices, atta and ghee were always imported from India. The men lived according to their Muslim way of life and military arrangements deferred to this as necessary. The British officers were fully conversant with the cultural needs of their men. Islamic holy days and religious events like Ramadan were always observed. Each camp had a mosque in a tent or a hut set aside for prayer. Each company had its own farriers to shoe and maintain the metal shoes for the mules. There were regular visits from K6 vets to inspect the animals and to deal with any problems. On the supply front, the tonnage of foodstuffs brought in for the mules and horses greatly exceeded that for the men. Imagine the daily routine of meals, roll calls, drills, parades, and inspections, the feeding and grooming and the exercise of mules and horses, the cleaning of stabling and the maintenance of saddlery, weapons, and equipment. At the camps, the men got ongoing training in animal care, handling, and loading of packs. There were also training films and activities for those men aspiring to promotion. Route marches with map reading exercises were a frequent activity. And sometimes there were special duties, as when in July 1943, 20 men and 23 animals were sent to clear the wreck of a crashed Whitley bomber from nearby Ben Alder. From their Aviemore camps, K6 supported three brigades of the 52nd Infantry Division for their mountain and snow warfare training. The main exercise, exercises involved large numbers of K6 men and mules carrying out multi-day exercises in the hills with the British infantry. The mules were carrying heavy weapons, ammunition, camping equipment and supplies. For example, exercise elephant used 44 men and 65 animals, while exercise Goliath had 256 men and 273 animals. Medical inspections of the men were carried out at their camps monthly. K6 took over a hotel in Aviemore to use as its hospital, as well as, well as Kinrara House near Loch Alvey. Men with more serious medical or surgical problems went to civilian hospitals like Raymore Hospital at Inverness. Despite precautionary measures, the infectious disease tuberculosis known as TB was a problem. Six of the men in the Canusi Cemetery died of natural causes, mainly TB. The other three died of unnatural causes. These were one who was crushed by an overturned lorry, one who was murdered by a colleague, and one, Khan Mohammed, who died of exposure when, in wintry weather and bad visibility, he got separated during the two day exercise sphinx high in the Glenfeshi Hills in October 1942. The slide here shows where this happened, albeit in rather different weather conditions. A search party found him dead on the hillside the next day. Let's brighten things up a bit now. Keeping the men occupied and maintaining good morale was an ongoing job for the officers. Each camp had a big tent for meetings, lectures, and film shows. Films were shown fortnightly, usually American and British commercial films, 
but Indian films too, when they could be obtained. Kasichs had welfare officers who arranged other entertainments like conjuring shows. The commanding officer knew that the men were anxious about their homeland. So every Sunday, they could hear the BBC Indian broadcasts in the main tent. They also had weekly current affairs reports and durbars, which were occasions when the men could raise with their commanding officer any issues that concerned them. Relations with the civilian population were very good. Some K6 men were almost adopted by local families, as these photographs on the right show. Local populations and households extended hospitality and contributed to the men's entertainment, while the men reciprocated with song and dance from their homeland. Thus, for example, at Christmas 1942, the Nairn Townswomen's Guild put on entertainments for Number 29 Company, who reciprocated with a concert in the local Regal Cinema. On a more formal note, at Goldsby in August 1943, Number 32 Company sent a detachment in full ceremonial, ceremonial uniform to attend the funeral of the Duchess of Sutherland. Today in the Highlands, memories of K6 men and their activities are still alive among older people who were children then. Some relics of K6 times are treasured today, as in Goldsby, where these sabers are kept by the local heritage society. Now to the end of the story. By mid 1943, the entire force K6 was located in Scotland, but the Norway plan had been abandoned, so there was nothing important for them to do. Back in India, they were wanted for the Burma campaign against the Japanese. Also, the men had had no home leave since coming to Europe. The first batch of 815 left in May and June 1943, and the last ones left in April 1944. Back in India, Force K6 was formally disbanded on the 25th of April 1944, and the men dispersed among other fighting units. That's it. I hope you've enjoyed this talk, that it's been informative, and that you've learned a little, about, a little about how the soldiers from India and Pakistan helped Britain to win World War II. Thank you very much. <laughs>